All right, guys, welcome back to our teaching in First Thessalonians. Now, the last time we were here, we completed chapter two when Paul was speaking about the example that he himself was setting for the Corinthians and how to live a life that was approved of God. And again, remember, we talked about one of those sub themes in Thessalonians that is working and providing for your own care, your own daily needs, because some of the Thessalonians had stopped working in their so-called waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. But nevertheless, one of those points was Paul's example in working hard. And the second part of that was living righteously, living devoutly for Jesus Christ, the idea as he himself waits for the Lord. And these two things began to be, were to be an example for the Thessalonians Christians. And Paul then continued to talk about the Thessalonians themselves to whom he considered to be his crown and joy and the affection that he had for the Thessalonians. So with that, we now continue on into chapter three because he is going to continue to talk about this great affection and longing and desire for the Thessalonians in chapter three. But what you have to remember is uh, the events of these particular things, that which inspired this letter, those events are found in Acts chapter 17. So it is so necessary for you to read that, to understand that when Paul first went into Thessalonica, common practice of his, he went into the synagogue of the Jews and there for three Sabbaths, Paul witnessed of Jesus as the Messiah, that it was necessary for the Messiah to have died and risen from the dead. And thus Jesus was this Messiah. The Jews as a whole rejected this message but a large number of Gentiles, were, these were Greeks who were attending the uh, Sabbath of the Jews, but a large number of Greeks believed the message of Paul, including a number of leading women of the city. And thus the Jews became jealous of Paul's missionary activities and they stirred up the city and Paul ended up having to leave. Leaving Thessalonica, you see later on, he went into Berea. From Berea, he went into Athens. And this is where we basically take up the idea of what's going on in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. While Paul was in Athens, after having to leave Thessalonica because of the violent uproar that the jealous Jews had started uh, in Thessalonica, even following Paul into Berea and stirring up trouble for Paul in Berea. And also we're going to see in chapter three, the uh, another theme that is found in first, first Thessalonians sufferings, sufferings and afflictions, the necessity of it, the destiny of it, how it is the plot, the plot, the plot, or should I bear, should I say it better this way? The lot given unto Christians to suffer. But I don't want to get into that prematurely. So let's just get into chapter three and then we'll discuss those particular issues. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. Now, this is some powerful text, and there are some interesting things that we need to talk about. So, Paul is continuing. There is a natural flow from the end of chapter two when Paul was talking about how the Thessalonians were his crown and joy and beloved by the apostle Paul. And remember what we talked about in chapter 17, Paul only, that is Acts 17. He only spent 
a short amount of time in Thessalonica. Some believe somewhere anywhere we know a minimum of three weeks. Remember, for three Sabbath, Paul reasoned with the Jews in the synagogue. So a minimum of three weeks. But some think maybe as long as or up until possibly six months. So the point is, Paul only spent a short amount of time in Thessalonica. So he did not get a chance to really ground them in the faith and teach them all of the things that he would normally teach a new church. Because remember, these were basically predominantly Gentile believers, and thus they didn't know a lot of things. And as a father would teach a small child, Paul, as a pastor and a shepherd for this new fledgling community of believers, he wanted to teach them. But what happened? The Jews, remember we talked about that just a second ago, the Jews became jealous, stirred up the town against Paul, and Paul had to prematurely leave. He had to leave before he wanted to. He had to leave before he had to teach, before having the chance to teach the Thessalonian Christians, to kind of grow them up in Christ and to give them certain knowledge about the faith, about so many things that you wanted to teach that child that is the Thessalonians. But because you yourself, Paul, run out of town, you didn't get a chance to teach them. So Paul's heart and his mind, his thoughts are with the Thessalonians, wondering how they are doing. Are they all right? And this is what he's talking about in chapter three, that concern that he had for them when he had to be rushed out of town. OK, so he says what he could no longer endure it. So while Paul was in Athens, that's again in the Acts chapter 17 that we talked about. He said, let me send Timothy to find out how they are doing. And you can see the heart and the mind of this apostle slash father of the Thessalonian Christians. So he sends Timothy to find out how they are doing. And notice what he said. Verse number two, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. So that is some of the work that Paul would have done when, when he was first in Thessalonica before he was ran out, he sends Timothy to continue the work, to strengthen the Thessalonians in their faith, to continue. Paul already laid down a foundation, that is Jesus Christ, him crucified and rose from the dead. But there is still so much more to the gospel, so much more to the faith that needs to be implanted in a church, especially in a new group of people. So he just basically does what? He sends Timothy to strengthen them in the faith. Verse number three, and here's where we want to spend just a little time, so that no one will be disturbed by these afflictions. And that word disturbs come from the Greek word sinistai, sinistai, which comes from the word sino, which, and, and here, uh, uh, that it, it is a somewhat of a dynamic equivalence. That is, we're not trying to give a direct word for word translation, but the word sino kind of means like a dog wagging its tail. That's the idea. And, and, and disturbed, it's a good translation because it lets you know what the apostle Paul is thinking. But to give you the flavor of how the word is used in this text, sinaste, uh, sanasta uh, means like a dog wagging his tail. That is to be going back and forward, to be going back and forward. So what is he saying? The Thessalonians having all of this troubling in their uh, Christian walk, all of this persecution by Jews and Gentiles, by these Jews. Remember the Jews that had an issue with Paul and their, the Jews stirred up the Gentiles. These, un, these are all unbelievers, of course. So these people are persecuting these new believers, these infant believers. And Paul did not want them to be going back and forward in the faith like the dog wagging the tail. Are you with Christ? Are you not with Christ? And are you not with Christ because of these persecutions? And so what? He sends Timothy to ground them to establish them, 
to encourage them so that they would be what? Not, not like the tail wag the dog going back and forth so that they would be firmly established and rooted in their faith, not be moved by their persecutions. Latter part of the verse. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. Now, here's what we want to do a little more Greek to understand what Paul, the emphasis of what Paul is trying to say. Especially, I have not seen in any letter where Paul loves to use this construction as much as in First Thessalonians. It's a short letter, but he loves to use that audite. But anyway, it just simply goes, our toy, uh, our toy God audite. And that we would say, for you yourselves know. Paul loves to say that. And the reason why this is so important is, even though Paul, and it's, and it's such an enlightening thing, even though we know clearly that Paul only spent a short amount of time in Thessalonica, one of the things that Paul was emphasizing was persecution and sufferings. Okay. So th and that's a wonderful thing. Even, and, and it also gives us too. It, it just shows how all of the scripture comes together to give a complete, uh, um, teaching about the faith, all of the scripture, all of the letters, all of the gospel, it brings about a complete teachings of what the faith is all about. One of the things that we see stressed here, and this also lays in first Thessalonians, one of the fundamental themes, purposes of the book of first Thessalonians, suffering and persecution, or should I even say sufferings and persecution? Okay, but let's just go back to the text. Then we'll try to bring all of this together. For you yourselves know, our toy God oidata, you yourselves know what? Hanti ace to toy kemetha. And I like that. You know what? That in this, in this, and that word kemetha, which it is called. We have been destined for this. We have been destined for this. Actually, well, that's true. That is the idea. That is the, as the, the translators, the translators are trying to give you an understanding of what that word actually means. That camo, that is to be set, to be set. Thus, the understanding is that Christians the apostles, Paul is speaking from uh, himself and the fellow workers of Christ, as well as the Thessalonians themselves, the Thessalonian believers. They, this is, you ever heard somebody say, this is my lot in life. Not so much as this is my purpose in life, but this is what, and this is what that word means, uh, a lot or something that is set. This is what has been set. For me, and thus the translators translate, we have been destined for this. And this is the overall uh, theme that we see in chapter three, especially, and one of the strong themes in First Thessalonians, and one of the strong points that I myself am trying to make to you. What? Okay, right now, uh, living in America where I am, and especially in times past. There has not there have not been a lot of issues with Christianity. And it's been growing. That is persecution of Christian uh, rejection of Christianity. There, it's been growing uh, opposition by the government. We've been seeing that a lot too. opposition by the government and other things as such. But for the most part, the United States is a very unique nation. It is a nation created by God. It is a nation that has been blessed by God that even in our constitution, we have what is called freedom of religion. You can worship God any way that you can. But what we have been seeing in these last days, let me say it like that, a heightening of persecution and rejection. So many times I myself have said as long as you are not a Christian in America or in any place in the world, that's fine. You can be anything that you want, but don't be a Christian. It is just something about being a believer 
of the Bible, a believer that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of is something about being a Bible based believer that causes so much consternation. It, it is so disagreeable with this country, with other countries. And clearly it is what the Lord Jesus has said. The world hated me, even what they hated Jesus without a cause. And our Lord continues to say what? And if they hated me, they will also hate you. If they call me Beelzebub, imagine what they will call those who follow him. So there is always this hatred for God's people in the world. But of late, we have been seeing a crescendo. It has been growing and growing the hatred and the intolerance for Christians. Okay, so here's the point that I'm trying to make. Notice what Paul says. This is our lot. This is our destiny. So in as far as we have been enjoying a sense of peace and a sense of toleration, we as Christians have been tolerated, especially I'm speaking about in America, particularly America, particularly, but we can always go into other parts of the world like Nigeria, where Christians are hunted for sport. But nevertheless, this tolerance for Christianity will come to an end. Why? Because God himself has allotted for our persecution, for our afflictions and our sufferings. And I don't want to get into all of the reasons why. Why? Think about what I just said. You need to think about it. God himself. That's why Paul says we have been destined well, who is it that destined us to suffering? Because that's the whole point about it. He says, what to the Thessalonians? I sent Timothy to you so that while you are suffering all of these afflictions, you don't get moved. Said, what is in the world that's going on? We are Christians. We are believing in God. Why are we suffering? Paul is saying, because we have been destined. Then the question becomes, well, who is it that destined us to suffer in this manner, to suffer for our faith, to suffer for believing in Jesus? God, the Father, has destined this. The point that I was about to make in that, I don't want to get into a long discussion about that because that is a topic all on its own. But simply to say it, to speak on the surface of that subject it allows us to be identified with Christ Jesus, as Paul says in a place, unless we are willing to suffer, that is, suffer along with Christ, we cannot reign. So as Jesus suffered, thus his people also suffer in their identifying with him. Jesus suffered ultimately unto death, death on the cross. And thus those who are of Jesus, and this is taught in the, in the New Testament gospels, you can see it all over the place. As Christ taught he himself would suffer, he made his followers to be aware that they would suffer. As Christ taught that he would be rejected, he made his followers know that they too will be rejected. It is an identification with our Lord. So thus Paul writes here, what we are destined to suffer persecution, to endure all suffering. And let me say what, what I'm, what I'm talking about suffering, what the Bible is talking about here. He is not talking about suffering the loss that everybody suffers. Say for instance, you're in a car accident and you suffer, or you suffer the loss of a child, the death of a loved one. That's not the suffering that God is talking about. He is talking about explicitly. And if I had to shout it out, explicitly suffering for your faith, suffering because you are a Christian. So it teaches that we need to prepare our hearts for suffering. You see, we, we, because we've had it so light, especially in this country. And, and so easy, and that is in comparison to other places in the world, especially in Muslim nations, where you can really severely be persecuted 
if you are not a follower of Islam, if you are a Christian, you can truly be persecuted even unto death. We've had it so easy that we consider uh, suffering for the faith to be something foreign to us. But especially as we enter into these last days and there are so many things, saints, that are trying to come into my mind and I, and I don't. I can't talk about it in this particular video, but just remember when you come into the last days, even that is at, and I, and I, I'm after the church age, after the rapture. But the point is, the world is moving in this direction. What the Antichrist Revelation chapter 13. OK, the Antichrist will come. He will not and he will be a one world ruler. The Bible teaches and all of those who have not been sealed from the foundation of the earth to be one of God's elect people, they will serve the Antichrist. And thus, everybody who does not accept the Antichrist as God will be put to death. He will try to put them to death. So the point that I'm trying to make is we are moving toward this time. There is no avoidance of it. You cannot pray it away. What did the Lord Jesus say? All these things, the coming of the end, all these things must be. You cannot stop. This is the predetermined will of God. So thus suffering will come to, uh, to, to a climax under the Antichrist. So the point that I'm trying to say because I'm making this a little too long. Suffering, even though especially Western nations, America, certain parts of Europe, it hadn't been a big deal, but it is becoming a big deal as we approach the end times. Thus, we need to prepare our minds. We need to prepare our hearts for that discomfort. It's going to come when standing up for your Christian belief will cause you trouble. It will cause you pain. It may cause you to lose your job suffering for the faith. Do not notice what Paul said. I sent Timothy to you to be so he can establish you so you will not be disturbed. So you won't vacillate so you can be grounded. What am I trying to say? When it's time for our sufferings to come, for your sufferings, for my sufferings, let us be grounded and let us not be amazed saying, what is the big problem? We're Christians. We're trying to do the right thing. Why does the world hate us so? Because that's the natural effect of what it is to be a Christian. The world belongs to the prince of darkness. The world follows Satan. And thus the world will always be ant antagonistic to Christian believers. The world will always hate you and do things against you and try to destroy you because of who you are and what you believe in that you believe in Jesus. Okay, enough. But the point that he was stressing was the destination. That is Christians have been destined to suffer for their faith. Verse number four, for indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance. I like that, that we were going to do what? Suffer affliction. Notice that another, see, that's the thing. One of the great things, suffering, 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 that we were going to suffer affliction. And so it came to pass, as you know, for this reason, what? When I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be in vain. So again, verse number three, he continues on verse number four, I'm sorry, to tell him, notice while we were with you, we kept telling, we kept telling that word is pra elegamen, pra elegamen. And that is used in the imperfect tense. That is kept telling, to kept telling, to tell pra before uh, uh, a lego main to keep on telling, to tell before hand. And that is, as I just said, in the imperfect tense, 
which which is stressing what the, that he is continually doing so he is doing what he is continuing telling them what that you are going to suffer that emphaticness he is emphasizing so a beautiful thing again such a short time that he was with these Thessalonians but nevertheless Paul experienced great suffering and also he was teaching these Thessalonians what prepare yourself to suffer Paul is therefore thus what in these words projecting to the church to the people of God what you will suffer get it in your mind even that you might have these transient times when you don't suffer Oh, don't get comfortable. In time, it will return and the suffering will be even greater. Okay, okay, okay. Going on, on. You'll suffer that you were going to suffer affliction. And Paul says that which I spoke about, uh, our sufferings, my sufferings, your sufferings. Indeed, it came to pass. So what? This is why I sent Paul. I sent Timothy to you to find out how you were doing, to know whether or not, this is the bottom line of that verse, number five, did you hold on? I came and preached Christ Jesus. All of a sudden, man, there was a barrage of sufferings from the Jews, sufferings from the Gentiles upon me, upon you. I had to leave. I don't know what happened. Did they hold on? Did they stay with the gospel? Or did they, because of all of the things that they were suffering, did the Thessalonians abandon their faith? Did they, did they abandon their faith in Christ because of Satan's assail against them? That's why he said that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Did we come and preach the gospel? Did we come and suffer all of these things? Even briefly though, briefly, but nevertheless, it was great suffering in preaching the gospel to you Thessalonians and you believed initially, but Satan came with a barrage of all of the persecutions against me, against you in Satan's war against you. Did you hold on? Because if you did not hold on, our preaching was of no avail. Our preaching was in vain. So what? I sent Timothy back to you to find out, bottom line, as preachers love to say, are you holding on? Okay, verse number six. But now that Timothy has come, and here's a praise the Lord part. Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all of our, notice, distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. Okay, let's just break this part up because it's a little lengthy, but the point is he is simply saying what? Remember, he was waiting for Timothy, Acts chapter 17. I think somewhere around verse 15. He was waiting for Timothy in Athens. He sent Timothy back to the Thessalonians to find out how they were doing and to strengthen them in the faith to kind of bring them to certain points of maturity and ascertain uh, y'all still holding on? Uh, y'all still remember us? Y'all still think kindly of the Apostle Paul? And, and y'all still with Jesus? Y'all still trying to live according to the truth that Paul has taught you? And I'm going to teach you some other things. And also another job of Timothy, bring back a report to Paul. How are they doing? Timothy has now come back to Paul. This is why Paul is talking here. Come and says, you know what? The Thessalonians are holding on. They still hold on to the truth of Christ. And I did the job that you sent me to do, and they cannot wait to see you just like you can't wait to see them. And so Paul says, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you for the Thessalonians. And that's all he was saying pretty much here about your faith and your love. I want to see us. And so for this reason, verse number seven, where I am now in all of our distress and affliction, and all this does is once again, 
add to the idea of the theme in first Thessalonians suffering and affliction. Notice all of the different words that he used. You're destined to be suffering afflictions, distresses, which lets you know this is a part of the Christian life. And if I had to go back and say something again to rehearse it one more time, do not be amazed when you have to suffer for your faith. Do not try to resist suffering for your faith. That is, try to avoid stuff that make you suffer because you are a Christian. Why? Go back to what Paul said once again in verse number three. We have been destined for this. This is the purpose of God in the Christian life. This identifies us with our master. And remember when Jesus said this, don't be ashamed of me. For whosoever would be ashamed of me in this world, of that person, of that one, I will be ashamed of before the father and the elect angels. So thus, don't be ashamed to suffer for Jesus. Don't try to go away, try to avoid these things. Why? It is our destiny. Okay, okay, enough of that. But let's go on. So Paul just simply says, what in verse number eight, we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. The whole point is, you you can see this is clearly rejoicing. We are, Lord, I thank you. (laughs) We really are all right as long as you are standing in the Lord. And in this, you can see the heart of an apostle. You can see the heart of a father's care for his children in the faith. This takes my mind back to something that my own father would say. And he would say to me, if you are all right, then I'm all right. And that's what Paul was saying here. I'm alive if you are standing firm in the faith. Verse number nine, for what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. So this is basically the uh, end of Paul's rejoicing verse from uh, from number six through uh, that verse that I just read. Verse number 10 It's basically Paul's praise to God and rejoicing for the Thessalonian believers that in all of their uh, sufferings and persecution for the faith, they are still standing firm. And Paul is simply thanking God for this. And that's why he says, for what thanks, verse number nine, where I am now, can we render to God for you? We're thanking God for your salvation. Thanking God for you holding on. Verse number 10. And notice what he says. We're praying to God night and day that they should be established. Again, keep all of the backdrop in mind. Paul, in his own sufferings and persecution in Thessalonica, being driven out of the city before Paul got a chance to complete the work that he intended to do with those new believers. And so he is is in a mind like, how are they? Are they doing all right? And thus you can see Paul as a worried parent doing what? He said, praying day and night, Lord, take care of them. Lord, bless them. Lord, keep them. Lord, help them. Lord, strengthen them. Lord, establish them. As Paul was thinking, he said, I didn't get a chance to finish what I wanted to do. And I know they are still children. And think about it. Can children survive on their own? Hardly no. But when God is in the background, when God is now unto him who is able to keep, when God is the father of the true elect and saved ones, then they will be all right. But nevertheless, from a humanistic point of view, Paul is worrying about them. He doesn't know. God knows. God keeps. God will establish. God will provide. And God did that using Paul to send Timothy back. 
God used Paul in sending Timothy back to provide, to strengthen, to bring to maturity. But Paul, the man of the human, he doesn't know. So what? He said, I worry about you like a parent all the time, but nevertheless, I still thank God for you. Okay, enough of that. I'm doing more preaching than teaching, I think. But anyway, notice he says, again, you can see, as Paul mentioned earlier, it is in chapter two, desiring to see the Thessalonians again. And that's what he talks about at the end of verse number 10. Desiring that we may earnestly see your face and notice at the end and may complete what is lacking in your faith. And that is self-explanatory. That is, remember, remember the backdrop had to leave. I only gave you the, the basic truths and I let you know, and it's amazing again in those truths, you're going to suffer, you're going to suffer. But Still so much that I didn't teach you. Right. So I want to come back to you so that the things that I desire to teach you, I now get the chance to teach you those things. So those things that are what lacking in your faith that I didn't get that opportunity to teach coming back to you. I pray to the Lord. I will now get that chance to do those do those things. All right. Verse number 11. Let's finish it out now. A prayer, finishing the prayer, that prayer from praise to prayer. May our God and Father himself and Jesus, our Lord, direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and in, abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish our hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Okay, basically Paul ends this particular section with a prayer and the idea is basically two things he's praying for. He's praying that he may be able to come back to the Thessalonians and of course to complete the labor that he himself has designed for them the teaching and instruction in the faith. So he, he wants to do that and for the establishment of the Thessalonians so that the, the Thessalonians will be all right in the day of Christ. OK, and we'll talk about all of those things as we bring this to a close. So verse number 11, he goes to say he opens up the prayer. God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ himself direct our way to you. We pray that God himself will allow us to come back to Thessalonica. Dear Lord, please take us back there. We got work to do, right? Then what? Verse number 12. The Lord calls you to increase and abound in love for one another. That's self-explanatory. He's praying that the Thessalonian Christians, that God help them to increase in their love for the body of for one another, for the Thessalonian Christians, for the Thessalonian church, for one another. Let God may God increase their love for one another. And then he says, and for all people, just as we also do for you. Now that all people it is a little ambiguous and I would not have translated it for all people. As a matter of fact, wait a minute, what is that? Verse number 12. As a matter of fact, he just simply says, uh, ka es pantas, ka, ka fapeer, ka chemes es humas. For all, even as, even we for you. So he simply says, pantas which they translate all people. It is ambiguous because when you say all people, you would think for everybody, everybody, you know, no matter who they are, saved or unsaved. That's not what Paul is talking about. Clearly the language is restrictive. It is expansive because he goes from what? For, for the Thessalonian church to all Christians. All what Christians he is not talking about unbelievers because notice the following just as we we who not we all the world because we all the world ain't loving uh, the Thessalonian Christian. The world is persecuting the Christian. But what 
we, the remainder of the body of Christ, we, all the members of the body of Christ, we love the Thessalonians too. We love God's people too. So he is simply saying, may God increase your love for one another in the Thessalonian church and your love for all the body of Christ to the, which I am a part of, I, Paul am a part of, and we as the body of Christ also love you just as we also do for you. And he continues the prayer so that what God will establish your hearts without blame. That idea once again of them holding on to the faith, to the truth that Paul was, has taught them holding on to Jesus and living a life worthy of their calling, living a righteous life before Jesus. That's what he always, a memptos, and I like that word. I love that. He translates that blameless, blameless. The idea, he's basically talking about living righteously. Why? As he looks forward, he, as all of God's people, as he looks forward to what? At the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of his saints. Now, let me briefly talk about that and we'll close it. So he finally ends the prayer. Want to come see you guys. He wants them to love each other and he wants them to love all of the saints of God. And he wants them to live right so that they will be found at the coming of Jesus. Because at the coming of Jesus, all saints will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He wants them to be found blameless. And the only way they're going to be found blameless, they have to live righteous lives right now. But the idea is he wants them to live right, to live right, to live holy. So that at the coming of Jesus and the coming of Jesus here is in reference to the rapture of the church. What Paul is going to talk about more so in the next chapter, chapter four. OK, the coming of Jesus. So at that time, when Jesus comes to get his saints, that they will be found, these Thessalonian believers, blameless. The Lord will be well pleased with their lives. But now let me bring about this part, uh, understanding to this part. When he talks about the coming of the Lord Jesus with all his saints, the, all of his saints is simply referring to as he's going to he, Paul is going to expand this. In first Thessalonians chapter four, all of the saints that are coming with Jesus at his return. This is this. Uh, I'm sorry. This refers to the souls and spirits, the spirits and the souls. Or you can sometimes just simply say the souls of the saints that return with Jesus, the saints who had already died. That's why when Paul talks about this, the dead in Christ, that's first Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, the dead in Christ, then we who are alive. But the point is, returning with his saints here, Paul is speaking about the souls of the saints who have already died that will return with Jesus in the rapture. All right. That ended up being longer than I anticipated. I truly enjoyed that. Again, let's rehearse what's going on in chapter three. We see basically the heart of the apostle and father, which Paul proved to be of the Thessalonian children, these new babes and believers in Christ Jesus. Paul, because of the circumstances, the situation that had developed when he was previously in Thessalonica, was driven out of town uh, so prematurely before he got a chance to really establish the Thessalonian church, Paul was overly concerned about their well-being. He wanted to know, were they still holding on or did the devil come in and tempt them and they abandoned their previously confessed faith in Jesus as Lord and Messiah. And therefore, their work, Paul's work, would be in vain. The devil would have won that. So he, he wanted to know 
about their spiritual well-being. So he sent Timothy to find out how they were doing and to also strengthen them. And when Timothy made it back to him, he told them the Thessalonians are doing well. They're, they're holding on and Paul, they miss you just as much as you miss them. And thus Paul began to thank God for the report of Timothy for the spiritual well-being of the Thessalonians and simply to say, because if you are doing well, then I'm doing okay. And then Paul begins to pray and he says, and I'm praying that God will let me come back to you so that the things that I wanted to do when I was first with you to strengthen you and establish you in the faith, I'll have that opportunity. And also to and in the meantime, love one another and also love all the saints as the saints love you and live right so that at the coming of Jesus, whenever he does come, you will be found blameless when Jesus returns with all of his saints. Okay. Thanks guys for joining me with that teaching. I really enjoyed that. And it's also too, you can see the heart of the apostle Paul. And it also teaches those of us who are pastors, the heart that you should have, we should have for our people to be ever so concerned with their spiritual well-being. Are they doing all right? Because what, if they are doing all right, then we are doing all right. But anyway, Thank you for joining me with that teaching. And if this teaching has been a blessing to you and you would like to support these continued teachings, there is a link in the description that you can use to support the ministry. And again, for those who have done so, thank you for your support. And if this video also has been a blessing to you, uh, hit the like button. And also, if you have not subscribed to the channel, do so. But anyway, God bless you and see you next time as we get into chapter four. And I don't know how far we'll be able to make it into chapter four, but I cannot wait to talk about the issues concerning the rapture of the church. But anyway, guys, see you next time.